Hi there, I'm Jason Harlow. Uh, today I'd like to go over the first four sections from chapter 14 of Wolfson on wave motion. This is the last chapter I'll be doing in, in this course. Okay, so the first section is on wave properties, and in that we'll talk about just the way we describe a wave, such as wavelength, frequency, the wave speed. Uh, next we'll talk about the wave equation, then we get into the specific case of wave on a string and we'll derive what the speed is of waves on a stretched uh, string. Then we get into wave power and wave intensity. And then we'll talk about sound waves and in particular the decibel scale which we can use to quantify uh, the sound intensity. And then if you look at this quote above, it says that a wave involves a disturbance that moves or propagates through space. The disturbance carries energy, but not uh, matter. So air, if you're talking to someone, air doesn't necessarily move from your mouth into that person's ear, but the, the energy of the sound uh, and uh, that information does does get carried. So, And if you want to look up at that uh, wa waving field of wheat, there's waves that are traveling through the wheat some may long distances, but obviously the wheat isn't getting up and uprooting and, and traveling along that distance. So, uh, let's get started. Okay, so a wave is a traveling disturbance that transports energy, but not matter. Mechanical waves are disturbances of a, of a material medium. So the medium uh, will oscillate in place, if you look at these blue dots, uh, and move briefly as the wave goes by, but the medium itself isn't transported any distance. But you can actually track the waves and see how far they go in a certain time and get the wave speed out of that. And electromagnetic waves, including light, do not require a medium. They propagate through the electric and magnetic fields. What are shown here is the, the red uh, vectors are showing the electric field, and the blue vectors are showing the magnetic field. And at any particular point in space, uh, they oscillate up and down those, those fields, but the fields themselves are carrying energy along at the speed of light perpendicular to the way that they're oscillating. So, transverse waves, uh, in, a, in a transverse wave, that's when the disturbance is perpendicular to the direction that the energy in the wave moves. So, for example, if you th think of these springs uh, connecting masses, and you move a mass up and down, well, the springs are stretched uh, from left to right, the wave will propagate uh, along from left to right, and each mass itself will only travel up and down. So it's called a transverse wave. And in fact, uh, an electromagnetic wave is a transverse wave, since the electric field and the magnetic field are both oscillating perpendicular to the direction that the, that the light travels. In a longitudinal wave, the disturbance is parallel to the wave motion. So if you disturb this block slightly, uh, from left to right, it'll begin to oscillate, and that oscillation and its energy are communicated to the next block, and so the wave propagates. And one of the properties here is that these blocks will be uh, more dense in certain places, like closer to each other with t uh, uh, compressed springs, and then in other places they'll be less dense and you, you'll have stretched springs. And in fact, sound is a longitudinal wave. Here we have a tuning fork, that when you strike it, boom, it vibrates, and then those that vibration sets up longitudinal waves in the air, and you can see there's compression areas with higher density air molecules, and then uh, rarefaction areas with lower density, and they travel they travel along in the same distance, same direction that the particles themselves are oscillating. That's a, that's a longitudinal wave. So. All waves, whether they are transverse or longitudinal, um, you can plot some displacement versus the position <coughs> in space. And for position x would be uh, the direction also that the wave is traveling. So the wave will be traveling along the x-axis, and now we're plotting uh, that disturbance magnitude versus x. So the wavelength, lambda, is the distance over which the wave repeats in space. Uh, so maybe from crest to crest of the wave, you could measure what lambda. Also, it would work if you measure trough to trough, or the place where it crosses the x axis going up to the next place, uh, any place where it's repeating. The period, T, capital T, is the time it takes for a complete oscillation, similar to how the, the period we defined 
for uh, simple harmonic motion, but now you're talking about the period as the wave travels by in one point in space, uh, what's the oscillation period of that particle? The frequency is 1 over the period, and the amplitude of the wave is the maximum value of the wave disturbance away from equilibrium. So in fact, if you go right from trough up to crest of a wave, that is a distance 2a, or a, dis a disturbance magnitude 2a. Wave speed is the, the rate at which one of, these, any, uh, one of these crests travels along, or troughs, travels from left to right in this case. And wave speed and wavelength and period and frequency are all related, so um, you can compute the wave speed as the, the distance lambda divided by the period t, because one period later the wave will have gone through one cycle, and now this crest will be over here. It will have moved a distance lambda. So this wave speed is lambda divided by t, or you could say lambda times f. Now, if it's a sinusoidal wave, also called a simple harmonic wave, then this is the equation for it. Uh, y equals a cosine uh, kx plus or minus omega t. So y is, again, measuring the disturbance at a position x and t, so it's a function of x and, and, and time. K is called the wave number. It's a new thing. It's 2 pi divided by lambda. So it's measured in radians uh, per meter, and it's a measure of the rate at which the wave varies in space. It's like sometimes called a spatial frequency. We will call it the wave number. Omega, we've seen before, is the angular frequency in radians per second, 2 pi divided by the period. It's a measure of the rate at which the wave varies in time. And it says plus or minus here. That is written so we can describe a wave that's either going in the plus direction, for which we would actually put a negative sign here, or if the wave is traveling in the negative x direction, for which we would put a plus there. And the wave speed, remember, is lambda times f. That can be written with omega and k as omega divided by k. So omega is radians per second. Uh, k is radians per meter. This ends up being the wave speed in meters per second. So let's do a couple, I guess, five uh, quick questions for you. Uh, looking at these two different waves, we're going to go through um, some of the properties that we've just talked about and ask for which wave is it greater. So which of these waves has the greater amplitude, which we will write as A? Uh, and so the answer here is A, this wave A has a greater value, this is A for that wave, this is A for that wave, looks a little smaller. Next question, uh, which of these two waves has the greater wavelength lambda? And for that one it's, it's, it's B, there's lambda from crest to crest for B is greater than it is for A. Which of these two waves has the greater period, T, and remember they're traveling at the same speed? So there is B. So remember, V is equal to lambda times F, or lambda divided by T. And so T is going to be lambda divided by V, if you just solve this equation for the period. So uh, the greater the wavelength, the greater the, the period as well, for equal speed wave. Which of these two waves has the greater wave number, K? Remember that one? K is 2 pi over lambda. Right, so is A. So remember, uh, if lambda is less, then the wave number K is going to be greater. And lastly, which of these two waves has the greater frequency? Should have gotten there that it was A again. So uh, T is lambda over V. Frequency is 1 over T. So the one with the shorter wavelength has a, a smaller period and therefore a greater frequency. Okay, so now you have the basic property of waves. I want to talk briefly about the wave equation. Many different types of media can support the propagation of waves, and if you analyze disturbances in different kinds of media, you always end up with the same basic differential equation, which is the second space derivative of some property is proportional to the second time derivative of that same property, and the proportionality constant turns out to be related to the speed of the wave, uh, 1 over v squared. This relation uh, this equation relates the space and time derivatives of some disturbed quantity, and v is the wave speed 
uh, which was, you know, lambda times f. <laughs> Any function of the form f of x plus or minus v times t can be substituted into this equation and will solve the wave equation. So it's not just sin, sin, sinusoidal waves. Uh, it could also be pulses. could also be very complicated um, waves such as uh, sound or something. They will all travel along at the same speed v. Okay, next section is wave on, waves on strings. So on strings or fibers or long springs, cables, wires, the tension uh, in the string will provide a restoring force if you pull the, the string sideways. So here comes a pulse, f of x and t, which goes over some little region. If we zoom in on this little part of the uh, string here, you can solve Newton's second law for a little angle uh, of 2 theta here. So C being the center of some approximately circular path here will give uh, mv squared over r the, the centripetal force on, on this little piece where v is the speed that this pulse is moving. So it's a little hard to picture it, but basically you find uh, if you solve this out for v, that v is proportional to, or is equal to, the square root of f, which is the tension in the string in newtons, divided by mu, where mu is the mass per unit length of the string in kilograms per meter. So v equals the square root, uh, f over mu is the speed of transverse waves on a stretched string. Okay, next section is wave power. The power carried by a wave is proportional to the wave speed, but also the square of the wave amplitude. So for waves on a string, for example, it turns out to be uh, one-half mu times omega squared times a squared times v. And whoop, other types of waves have similar equations for average power, but they're always dependent on the square of the wave amplitude, a squared, as it is here. Next wave intensity is the power crossing a unit perpendicular to the area. So in a plane wave, like a sound wave or something that's going in a, in a straight direction from a very distant source, this plane wave doesn't spread out, so the amount of power passing through of each of these pink windows is constant, and they're all the same area. However, if you have waves traveling away from a, from a point source out into space, then you can actually make this big cone where the same amount of power is being transported through these windows, but the area of these windows is increasing as you go further away, and it's increasing as r squared. So the intensity, which was power per uh, unit perpendicular area, as that area increases, the uh, intensity decreases as 1 over r squared, the distance where r is the distance from the source, or it's the equation for intensity from a point source is total power divided by 4 pi r squared, where 4 pi r squared is the area of an entire uh, sphere that uh, has radius r centered on the source. Okay, so let's talk about sound waves. Here we're plotting pressure versus distance, uh, where pressure is related to the density of air. So, and you can see here, you've got rarefied gas, and you've got denser gas. In the regions where uh, the molecules are more densely packed, you have higher uh, sound pressure. Sound waves in air involve small changes in air pressure just above and below this ambient air pressure P sub zero. So P sub zero is about 100,000 pascals. That's, that's uh, the background pressure. So what a sound wave is is slightly uh, a wave that's slightly above and slightly below this ambient pressure. So this isn't negative pressure here, it's just a little bit below 100,000 pascals. And so that was plotting pressure. You can also plot the displacement of these particles versus distance from their equilibrium position. So right here uh, at this rarefaction, that's showing where um, uh, molecules are moving at maximum velocity, but they're, they're passing their equilibrium position. And also right here, um, molecules are, are moving towards each other. So, and it's right in between a, a rarefaction and a high pressure zone where the air has its maximum displacement, um, but the, the pressure is at its equilibrium value. 
The speed of sound in a gas depends on the background pressure, that ambient pressure P, the density of the, of the air, and a, a gamma, gamma factor uh, that depends on uh, the number of atoms that form a typical gas model, molecule. So the basic idea of this equation is that the speed of sound is determined by the air itself, the properties of the air, and it does not depend on the properties of the sound, such as amplitude, frequency, or wavelength. And if you solve this out uh, in dry air at atmospheric pressure and room temperature, the speed of sound is uh, 343 meters per second. So the human ear responds to a broad range of sound intensities and frequencies. We can hear as low as about 20 hertz and as high as about 20,000 hertz. And we can um, hear different intensities on order over 12 orders of magnitude or 12 um, factors of 10, so, so I guess that's a trillion times different uh, uh, mag intensities. So we define a sound intensi intensity level beta as measured in decibels. So you take the sound intensity, divide it by uh, I sub zero, which is the threshold of hearing, 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared. You take the logarithm base 10 of that, and multiply by 10, and that gives you the sound uh, intensity level in decibels. So, for example, um, if you have something which is at 10 to the minus 12 intensity, 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared, then that corresponds to zero uh, decibels. And so, uh, the logarithm of 1 is zero. If you have 100 times more intensity, 10 to the minus 10, that corresponds to 20 decibels. Since you've gone up by a factor of 10 to the 2, that, uh, the logarithm is, is 2, and 10 times um, 2 is, is 20. And each time you step up a factor of 10, you increase the intensity level by uh, adding 10 decibels. And it gets right up to the threshold of pain. One watt per meter squared corresponds to 120 decibels. Um, and then on this hor uh, horizontal axis here, we're showing the different frequencies. So the human ear can hear as low as something like maybe 40 decibels at 50 hertz. But if you increase the hertz, our hearing is most sensitive, actually way up here at uh, 3,000, 4,000 uh, hertz. These are very... Um, uh, high-pitched sounds. This is the sound, the frequency of a lot of uh, smoke alarms in your house. Is beep, 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 and you can hear it pretty well because that's where our ears happen to be most uh, sensitive.